Hi, I'm Dr. Craig Goodmurphy, and welcome to the Anatomy Guy, Clinical Subspecialties. Thank you, Dr. Goodmurphy. I'm Dr. Virginia Stewart, and I'm here to talk about abdominal aortic aneurysms, or triple A's. I'd like to start with a case presentation, followed by aortic clinical anatomy, aneurysm pathogenesis, clinical features of triple A's, diagnosis, and ED management. For our case presentation, we have a 65-year-old male who comes from home, presents per EMS. He has sudden onset of pain radiating to his back that started 20 minutes prior to arrival. He's obese, anxious appearing, very diaphoretic. On his, a physical exam, a focused assessment, his lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. He has a tachycardic rate, regular rhythm. His abdomen is soft, non-tender, non-distended. He has two plus peripheral pulses times four extremities and no peripheral edema. His initial vital signs, he has a blood pressure of 90 over 60. His heart rate is 115 and sinus on the monitor. He's breathing 18 times per minute, 92% saturation on room air, and his temperature is 99. For our initial emergency department workup, we want to consider oxygen, uh, two peripheral IVs placed, and a cardiac monitor. While we're drawing labs to consider what labs we would like to, to send, the patient has a decreased mental status, he becomes less responsive, his blood pressure is now 60 over 40. Our initial management is going to resuscitate him with two liters of crystalloid fluid, either normal saline or lactated ringers, and his blood pressure with this intervention improves to 100 over 60. Our differential diagnosis, we have a sick appearing man who's diaphoretic and hypotensive. He has shock. With shock, I think of SHONAC, or an acronym for septic type shock, hypovolemic, obstructive, neurogenic, anaphylactic, or cardiogenic shock. The faster that we can find the type of shock that we has, the better we can implement an uh, intervention to resuscitate him. Does he have septic shock? He's not febrile, doesn't have history of any recent infection, so probably not. Could this be hypovolemic shock? Possibly. This could be obstructive shock. He could have a pneumothorax or pericardial tamponade. Is this neurogenic shock? There really isn't any history of any spinal trauma. He moves all of his extremities. There's no gross focal neurodeficit on our focused exam. Could this be anaphylactic shock? Probably not, since there's no history of any allergen exposure. Could this be cardiogenic shock? Possibly. He could be having a, a heart attack. Um, his blood pressure is uh, down. He uh, has had uh, diaphoresis. So to help us to differentiate between these types of shocks, we've narrowed this down to hypovolemic, cardiogenic, or obstructive. We can use a bedside modality for ultrasound, a fast exam, or a focused assessment with sonography for trauma, but there are medical applications, as we will see here. And with that, Dr. Bias will help us lead us through a fast exam. For our FAST exam, we have our bedside ultrasound machine in Dr. Byer's hand, and in his hand is our curvilinear probe. We also have our patient, and for our FAST exam, we need to look at four areas. A subxiphoid cardiac window, which is this gel there. Also, we need to look at Morrison's pouch, or the hepatorenal uh, recess, which is this blob of gel, and the splenorenal recess, if this blob of gel, and the pelvis. For the FAST exam, the first area that we want to look at is at Morrison's pouch. The probe marker is placed towards the patient's head at the lateral costal margin, more inferiorly to get a better look at the liver, which we will look at now. The probe marker position towards the head is actually indicated by this dot here on our screen. So we see have here liver uh, behind me and then kidney. There is no black hypoechoic stripe between the liver and kidney along this line indicating that there's no fluid present. Sometimes rib shadowing can obscure your view between the kidney and the liver so we have the patient take a deep breath in and breathe out so we can scan through and see the entire liver behind the rib shadowing. Next after viewing Morrison's pouch we reach across the patient to the patient's left with the probe marker pointed up towards the head the probe is going to be placed at the uh, right lateral more posterior costal margin. This hand positioning will be a little bit more posterior than the previous. Now we see here an image of the spleen and the kidney. There is no hypoechoic fluid between the spleen and the kidney. This is a negative fast exam. To better visualize the kidney and spleen, the patient can take a deep breath in and exhale to move the anatomy beyond the rib shadows. 
pointing out the anatomy that we have on screen, this is spleen, followed by rib shadow. And then on the other side, as the patient takes a deep breath in, we have the kidney comes into view. The ratio of the kidney to the spleen should be one to one. If the spleen is larger, then we worry about splenic injury. And next for our FAST exam, we're going to place with the probe marker towards the patient's right, we're going to place the probe just caudally to the uh, xiphoid process. Using the liver as an acoustic window, we're going to uh, pan and scan through and visualize the heart in the sub xiphoid view. To point out the clinical anatomy that we see here, we are using the liver as an acoustic window. We see in first come to the right ventricle the left ventricle and the septum. This is a normal beating heart that is not hyperdynamic. There is no hypoechoic stripe or black line indicating a pericardial effusion. This is unlikely cardiogenic shock. The patient is not tachycardic here and there is nothing indicating a pericardial effusion. Next, taking our ultrasound probe with the probe marker still facing the patient's right, we're gonna place the probe uh, above the pubic symphysis to look at the bladder. Scanning through, we see normal bladder with no with, with hypoechoic fluid in the center of the bladder where we would expect to find urine, but no hypoechoic fluid outside of the bladder and a normal prostate. Back to our 65-year-old hypotensive diaphoretic patient who had a normal uh, pericardial window. He had a normal uh, splenorenal recess and no fluid in his pelvis. However, on the view of Morrison's pouch between his liver and his kidney, we have liver tissue here followed by kidney with this black stripe, which represents fluid. With the FAST exam, you need to make sure that you include the entire liver tip because sometimes there can only be fluid in this region here, but not fluid further along the stripe between the kidney and the liver. So things to consider during the FAST exam, you do want to check your probe marker for orientation. You do want to position the patient supine. You do want to scan all four quadrants looking for free fluid. You don't want to forget to include the entire liver. And you don't want to forget that a hemodynamically unstable patient may still be bleeding. In the case of this patient who does have fluid in his pelvis, without evidence or story for possible solid organ injury, we have to think that the blood may be coming from somewhere else, somewhere like a large blood vessel, such as the aorta. And now we will go to the Gross Anatomy Lab with Dr. Good Murphy to learn about clinically relevant abdominal aortic anatomy. For the clinical anatomy of this section, we've taken a cadaver where we've removed the abdominal contents to look at the posterior abdominal wall. And to orient you, you can see here the, the right kidney and the left kidney. And we can tell that because we have the left renal vein crossing the midline and the IVC on the right. Here's the diaphragm superiorly doming across all of the abdominal contents, separating it from the thoracic cavity. The liver would be in this upper right quadrant here, just sitting over uh, by the diaphragm, and Morrison's pouch is in the posterior aspect, in behind that liver, and between the kidney, which would be covered by peritoneum because it's a retroperitoneal structure. Now what we'll want to do is look at the vessels of the aorta, which we can see running up the midline here. Remember the aorta in the abdominal side is going to begin after it passes behind the thoracic diaphragm at the level of T12 vertebrae. We can even see the esophagus right in here that's passing through the diaphragm in the cruse at the T10 level. The IVC would be going through at T8. Now let's zoom in a little bit more and look at some of the branches of the aorta. There's really two ways of dividing up the branches of the aorta. There are the paired vessels and the unpaired vessels. The paired vessels include things like the renal vessels, all of the segmental vessels, the gonadals, and then of course it will bifurcate at the end. The unpaired vessels um, will include the celiac, superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. The celiac, as we can see here, has three major components to it. There's the branch that will run to the left, the splenic, there's a branch that will run superiorly, the left gastric, and there's a branch right here that will run to the right, which would be the common hepatic. And those will supply all of the foregut and foregut associated organs. Then immediately below that, we have the superior mesenteric. And right in here, we can see the celiac ganglia that would supply some of the sympathetic autonomics to the area. 
This is the superior mesenteric, and remember, it's supplying all of the midgut structures. And it's crossing over the left renal vein at this location, so if there's an abdominal aneurysm at this point, it can create that nutcracker effect that you may have heard of. If we pan down on this aorta now, we can see one of the gonadal vessels coming off, and then coming to the left, right here, that third unpaired branch, which is going to be the inferior mesenteric. The inferior mesenteric is coming over to feed the hindgut, which would include the descending sigmoid and the rectum. Now we can see the bifurcation point, which is right at the level of L4. And that's about the iliac crest level on external palpation. The IVC is just forming underneath of those common iliacs as they come off, and that's going to be at the level of L5. As we move back up to the, some important levels for imaging, you'll know that the inferior mesenteric is around L3. Then there's a little bit of a gap because they have the uh, beginning of L2 where we'd have the superior mesenteric, and then we're going to have T12 or the beginning of L1 for the celiac, and then the abdominal aorta coming through in behind the diaphragm at around T12. And there'll be some variation from individual to individual. Let's go back to the ultrasound table so we can look at some of these in the clinical scan. To scan the abdominal aorta, we first start with the probe marker positioned up towards the patient's head. The probe is going to be positioned just to the left, to the patient's left of the umbilicus, a uh, little left of midline. And next, we show what we see on our bedside ultrasound screen. We see that the SMA and celiac have just come off. We're scanning down and moving the probe downward towards the patient's feet. We see the two parallel lines in the black hypoechoic region indicating that there's blood. This is the abdominal aorta, and we are scanned down towards the feet in the bifurcation of the common iliacs. It's uniform throughout its length, and scanning back up, it maintains its uniformity, indicating that there is no aneurysm. After our longitudinal views of the aorta, we want to scan back up towards the patient's head. We're still left of the umbilicus, and we're going to turn our probe marker 90 degrees to get a transverse view. The probe marker here is going to be onto the patient's right side. Now we'll scan to the image on the ultrasound screen. We have here frozen. We have, uh, just to orient us, we have down here is going to be the spine. This hypoechoic or black structure is the aorta. With the celiac trunk coming off, we have on this side of the screen is actually the patient's left, since our probe marker is to the right, pointed to the patient's right from earlier. On the, this side of the screen, this patient's left is the splenic artery coming off and the common hepatic vessel coming off here. We're going to scan towards the proximal aorta. We're going to freeze one more time. Here, we're going to want to take our measurement of the proximal aorta. We want to go from this outer wall and measure down to this outer wall. We want these measurements to be less than three centimeters in both the proximal and distal aorta. Now, continuing on our scan, we're scanning down towards the feet. We watch the aorta looks nice and round. There's no saccular outpouchings. We freeze right here. Right before we branch off to the common iliac arteries, we're going to scan again from the outer wall here to this outer wall, and we want for this measurement to be three centimeters or less. Continuing our scan, we watch the common iliacs break off into the patient's left and the patient's right. 